Ready, give it to go. Terence, you first. Accio. Good. Bailey. Accio. Very good. Luke. Accio. Wonderful. Now Gretchen. Accio. Excellent. Now all together on the count of three. One, two, three. Accio Hogwarts Radio. This is Hogwarts Radio, episode 243 for May 12, 2019. Hogwarts Radio is the official podcast for Wizarding News from HPANA, discussing all things Harry Potter, Fantastic Beasts, and the rest of the Wizarding world. For the quickest up-to-date news on the franchise, make sure you check out wizarding.news. Hello everyone, and this is Hogwarts Radio, broadcasting to Harry Potter fans worldwide, since 2008, I'm Terrence Pinkston. I'm Alex Lohman. And I'm Gretchen Rush. Our show can be found virtually anywhere online, such as iTunes, the Google Podcast app, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Stitcher, Radio Public, and other places where podcasts are aggregated. It doesn't matter where or how you listen. Just make sure to tap the subscribe button, and we guarantee you'll have a new episode each Sunday. We also invite you to follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, so you never miss an update from the show. Don't forget, Hogwarts Radio is also on Patreon. By pledging, you'll have instant access to many benefits, including Into the Common Room, behind-the-scenes planning of the show, Hogshead Radio, and much more. Sign up today over at patreon.com slash Hogwarts Radio. Welcome to episode 243, and we've got a lot to talk about this week, you guys. I'm excited about this week's show. Um, even more excited to tell everybody that Alex got a tattoo. <laughs> I don't know why I'm so excited for this, but it's like, it's so cool. I love it. You make me feel so cool. Stop it. <laughs> um, yes, I did. I got a tattoo on Sunday. I am a collector of tattoos. Um, not a ton, but I have a couple. Um, this one was special though, because this was my first Harry Potter piece. I have always wanted to have a Harry Potter piece, but I have a personal rule with tattoos that I think about a design. And if I like it like a year or two later, and I'm still pretty serious about it, then I will commit to it. So I've been thinking about this Luna Love Good design for a while. Um, and now it's permanent and I love it. And it's colorful and magical and just wonderful. So what is the design? So the design is I... I, I researched a lot about Luna Love Good tattoos, and everyone kind of has the specs. Um, some people have like the, the, her earrings are just like little fragments of her, and I kind of wanted to extrapolate and do something unique. Um, so I had my friend Rebecca Loveless, who's this beautiful artist, create this kind of whimsical looking radish, like true real lifestyle radish. And then it's got like some magical, like, uh, like stars and dust around it. And then there's a nice little quote in it from Luna Love good herself that says you're just as sane as I am it sounds so magical <laughs> it was magical the pain was not magical but the finished project <laughs> is truly magical how long did it take um this piece took about a little over two hours hmm. uh, which actually wasn't too bad no. and the 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 paint itself actually really was not that bad it was just at the end when you're getting a little raw and you're doing the shading and you're just like oh my body can't take anymore um as as my friend Rebecca says she's like oh is it getting a little spicy for you and it's like yeah it's getting real spicy <laughs> uh, but you just gotta hold on and finish so Wow. Well, it really does look great. Does anybody else have tattoos? I don't have any. Um, you don't, Terrence? I don't. I know. I need to be become part of the Cool Kids Club, I guess. And You do. And cool kids are doing it. I, I yeah. don't know. What about you, Gretchers? I do have one. I have a, a Van, Van Gogh quote on my back. Van Gogh quote. Um, I really want a Harry Potter one. I've been thinking about it for, you know, many, many years. But... Like Alex, I have to ruminate. I have to think of just the best design. And hers is lovely. So now I have to think of something totally different from that. <laughs> so just give me a couple more years and I'll get there. Yeah. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'm right there. And I guess, hey, after you get yours, I'll get mine. Why not? You better not, there we go. Go, you better not go get it well, this weekend. Like, seriously. <laughs> 
<laughs> go Gretchers, go. Uh, no, but Terrence, if there's any particular like character or quote or anything that you would even consider as like your dedication to Harry Potter, what would you think about? You know, I've, I've actually been thinking about this for quite a while. If I were to ever get a Harry Potter tattoo, it wouldn't be of anything Harry Potter. It would be of Hogwarts Radio. And I think I would probably get the Hogwarts Radio logo somewhere. I have no clue where <laughs> I would put it yet. Um, but something Hogwarts Radio related, definitely. I was thinking that, that we should all get Hogwarts Radio tattoos like the stars of Lord of the Rings. Oh. And they all got tattoos. Band of we are just as cool. We are. <laughs> <laughs> what would we get though? Like, I, I as a, as a Hogwarts radio team, what could we put? Everybody's got like this look on their face. We're thinking. Like, we're pondering. Stay classy, Hogwarts. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Stay classy. Hogwarts. I, I would not object to that. I think that would be pretty legit. Be pretty good. Or yeah. Hashtag on our forearms. Oh, that's what's our up. Foreheads. Foreheads. Oh, foreheads. <laughs> no forearms, like our own little. Just like flat dark, like mark. dark mark. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, what's up? Oh Dang, my it's goodness. A radio mark. Calling all artists. <laughs> <laughs> Send us some designs now. Thank you. I know Bailey has a Deathly Hallows tattoo that she got a couple of years ago. Um that, that looks really neat. Um that's well done. Mm -hmm. I'm not quite sure if Luke has one. I'm guessing no on that. Really? You can correct me. <laughs> but my guess is no. <sighs> hmm. <laughs> well, we'll be able to ask him in a couple of weeks whenever he comes back uh, as soon as he's done wrapping up season eight over once there. Once Westeros is conquered. Yeah, yeah, once Westeros is conquered. Oh. <laughs> oh, two episodes left and I can't believe it. It's just, it's like. It's so stressful. Yeah, it really is. It really is. I haven't been this stressed since Deathly Hallows. <laughs> Speaking of Deathly Hallows, guys, it's been 21 years since the Battle of Hogwarts. And we, we kind of remembered this a couple of days ago um, on May 2nd. And J.K. Rowling has officially apologized for killing no one. She has continued her Twitter hiatus. And from the looks of it, she doesn't plan on returning anytime soon. Yeah, I love going on the interwebs on May 2nd every year and finding out who Joe has apologized for because she always apologizes for the death of someone during the Battle of Hogwarts. Um, So this year I was like, oh, this might be a good one. Um, Waiting and waiting, thinking maybe I could write an article for MuggleNet about it, waiting a little more, seeing people post, being like, did she apologize? <laughs> did I miss it? Checking her Twitter feed, seeing that her Twitter cover photo was changed, but not granted us with a tweet so yeah it was a little sad that we were not given an apology this year yeah you know it, it felt like kind of a big middle finger to the fandom like by saying oh here i see you you know i'm on twitter look you can see i'm on twitter because i changed my header but i'm not going to give you what you want i was kind of i was kind of disappointed but i mean who can blame her every time she gets on social media now she's either attacked or belittled and i mean i wouldn't want to be a part of it either but at the same time don't punish everybody for it you know we got to know is lavender brown dead or alive agreed that is the question i want there there obviously are apologies i would like but i would like an apologetic answer on that topic um i swear i didn't notice that she changed her header so when gretchen you mentioned that i like quickly grabbed my phone and like looked up her twitter handle interesting cover photo um the uh, the one thing that I was thinking about though is she's been on her hiatus and I imagine if I were her since I am such a Twitter addict um if I couldn't post I did give up Twitter for Lent one year and oh, I think that was the most difficult Lent I have had <laughs> um but I imagine that she's like tweeting into like the drafts folder of her Twitter account and then once the like hiatus is lifted whether it's like self-imposed Fantastic Beast 3 related Maybe someone's like, you just need to do a cleanse. I don't know. Um, but whenever that moratorium is lifted, I am just waiting for the moment that she publishes like all of these drafts and just her thoughts for months come flooding through. And it just would be glorious. I would love it so much. 
so much. You know, it would be amazing if she turned it into a book <laughs> and sold it and, do- <laughs> and donated like all the proceeds to Lumos. That would be wonderful. Yeah, oh. it's pretty legit. I could see it. First Twitter handle. So <laughs> since she changed her header to a picture of stars, Gretchen, you wanted to ask us if this was significant. Yeah, what's up? Because I mean, I can't imagine she forgot that it was the anniversary of the Battle of Hogwarts. So the fact that she did it on that day, I think has some significance by itself. So then you have to kind of think about, well, why did she choose this photo? And it's just like a picture of stars. So why did she why did she choose this? What do you guys think? I mean, my real answer is I I have no clue. Um, it's maybe those are the thoughts swimming around in her head right now that she can't put <laughs> down through this hiatus or maybe it means like she was going to fight Thanos. I don't know. I mean, she's <laughs> hanging out with Captain Marvel. Oh, mm-hmm. I can imagine that. Joe and mm-hmm. Captain Marvel, that'd be cool. Um, that would be cool. But uh, I mean, honestly, I don't know. Jo- and, and the thing that we know about J.K. Rowling is that she never does anything like this without a reason you know no she's left clues in her twitter handle or her twitter photo before she put it as a picture of brazil before she revealed that the next movie would be taking place in brazil so it's no mm, accident typically she normally does do this on purpose so i'm very curious Mm -hmm. i would like to like give her a poetic justification and say that you know she, we, this is me reading real deep, guys. Um, but, uh, you know, like when, when someone passes away and we are in mourning or in like remembrance, we kind of always have this imagery of like looking up to the heavens and like you have conversations with ever being you believe in, spiritual and whatnot, religious, you, you look to the heavens. So part of me is like, well, is she posting a picture of a bunch of stars to commemorate a bunch of people that she killed in the battle of Hogwarts. And like, this is like, they're in memoriam. Is it kind of like the, the easy way to apologize for everyone's death without naming everyone. Um, But that's just like me being kind of silly with it. Um, You know, I don't know. And it's going to be interesting when it's revealed what the meaning is, because like you said, Gretchen, she never does anything haphazardly or unintentionally which makes her wonderful joe um i um just feel like so behind the times that i didn't know that she had changed it and especially she had changed it on the battle of hogwarts so now my brain is just swimming oh so if it does symbolize all the characters that she killed that's a lot of characters but she really didn't kill a lot of characters like i, I mean she the deaths were significant that's why they felt like they they weighed a little bit more so I, I, I'm not quite sure um, what she's going for with this. But, hey, I, I, you know what? We should, like, we should start a pool on when she's going to come back. <laughs> we'll call it the J.K. Rowling return to Twitter pool. I don't know. Anyway. Is this going to be a pool amongst hosts? Should we make it, like, amongst all of our listeners on Twitter? Like, you know, we're, we're taking taking guesses here, see who's closest, Well, get the fandom engaged. Yeah, I, I mean, I was going to say not keep it between hosts and listeners, but the entire fandom. Why not? Let's take bets. Everybody, hey, hey, hey. everybody just throw in a dollar. Can you imagine that? Oh my goodness, <laughs> that would be a lot of money. <laughs> anyway, uh, so this got me thinking, you know, this Battle of Hogwarts anniversary and how Harry defeated Voldemort with <laughs> Expelleramus. Um, which people still have a problem with to this day. But how would we have defeated Voldemort? I'll tell you how I would have defeated Voldemort. I would have spent seven years training and learning and gaining skills to kill. And then I would have leapt on him from behind. And then when he tried to attack me, i do a quick hand switch with the knife. And then stab him in the heart. That's just, I mean, it's like a random thought, but I think that's how I would do it. You sure the knife didn't drop? It had to it be might like have been a drop. drop. Okay, just clarifying. Yeah. Just clarifying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Knife drop, switch hands, stab, you know, just just a random thought I had. But the key por- point of that is I would spend seven years training to do that. So I, I just want to throw throw that out there. Oh, I see. Okay. Um, I'm I'm at a, I'm at a loss for that. That I think that's probably the best way. Um, I would have killed them with 
probably, I mean, I, I don't know, some sort of muggle contraption, maybe a knife, yeah, but maybe, I mean, I'm not talking about, like, you know, a, a weapon or anything, like, a, I don't know, maybe a piece of glass or, I don't know, um, something something other than magic, you know, I feel like it would be. What? Why? Because it'd be, I don't know. <laughs> Glass? Well, a piece of glass, like slit his throat or something. <laughs> That's morbid. <laughs> <laughs> I would go out Game of Thrones style. <laughs> just like little finger style, right? <laughs> yeah. No, but I, I mean, I would probably just use any any kind of muggle means of killing him. I feel like I, I wouldn't want to waste good magic on Voldemort. Also, he probably doesn't even know all the muggle ways that you could use. So if you like do like a trap line or like plant C4, he's going to be like, what is this? You got C4? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, has anyone here, and I know this is like a left field comment, but has anyone here read The Lovely Bones by Alice Siebel? I no. have not. Nah. Bailey, I tried it. Bailey okay. probably I tried has. it. No, yeah. thanks. Too dark. Yeah. Wool, wool heavy. Wool um, heavy. <laughs> wool heavy. It's a great book. But there's there's this whole conversation about what is the best murder weapon. <laughs> yeah, commenting on a heavy book. Um, anyway, so it, it's, you know, told from the point of view of a teenage girl. And she's like, you know, in heaven we play this game. What is the best way you could murder someone? And so one of the, the things that she comments on is like the, the lethal icicle. Because it would like drop on someone and kill someone, and then the murder weapon would melt away, and you would never know who did it. Um, and I always feel that's like I don't know when people are like, "How would you kill someone?" I'm like, "Hmm." Um, I I struggle with this question only because the way it's crafted in the books it makes you feel like there's no other reasonable conclusion you can come to to kill Voldemort. And I can like, consider myself a, a pretty dang creative person, um, and so for me to like have this like brain fart of like just can't compute about how I would kill Voldemort is like very perplexing. Um, Terrence, I, I guess like I see your point, but I'm still really fascinated about this whole theory that you would kill him with some mundane muggle method because you don't want to waste the magic. Like, are you saying that Harry wasted good magic? No, I'm saying that Harry wasted his shot. Who the hell kills the dark lord, the, the darkest lord of all time with a disarming spell? <sighs> a that, boy, that, man. A good, boy. That, it bothered me. It really bothered me. Um, well, to my it. point, he spent seven years training on that spell, and he learned it real good. But no, I wouldn't want to waste magic on him. I would feel like, I, I look at magic as kind of like this sacred thing that you you have to protect um, and that you have to use with great responsibility, even though the, like witches and wizards use it so casually. I just feel like it would be like wasteful. It would be it would be inappropriate. It would be um, disrespectful to magic. Kind of looking at magic as like a it's <laughs> like a a property a thing um that you have to that you have to respect i don't know uh, it's 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 a little out there and it's a little it's a little heavy but i think it's I really know. unique i actually love it i've never thought about it that way i guess my follow-up question is does that extend to all death eaters all practicers of dark magic or is it just voldemort as kind of the epicenter of all things evil and like the disruption of pure magic uh, the second part, yes, uh, definitely. Uh, I believe magic should be used to, uh, sure, you can capture people, you can bind people, you can, um, you can hold people, um, but whenever it comes to, like, capital punishment using magic, I, I don't believe in it. And that's weird because I believe in capital punishment in the, in, in the muggle world. But, I mean, at the same time, it's like, no, you're going to die through this other means that we have, this non-magical means. So I'm expecting The Philosophy of Magic by Terrence, a bestseller out next summer, because I am so, like, I am intrigued by this conversation. I think it's really interesting because we all kind of come up with, like, clever and witty ways and, like, who knows the most factually about the books. But, man, 10 points for D being just, like, truly deep tonight, Terrence. 10 points. Because I'm totally in a position to be giving points, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you. 
So yeah, we'd love to hear everybody's theory on that. Maybe that's something we'll dive into on a future episode uh, as well. But would you waste magic on killing Voldemort? Or would you waste magic handing out capital punishment? If that's what you believe in. Well, I feel like we're already we're already so deep into the show now. Uh, we have some news to catch everybody up on over the past uh, couple of weeks. So um, we have a release date now for Fantastic Beast three, right, Gretchers? Yes, we do. This is probably the biggest piece of news that happened um, in the past couple of weeks. They announced the official release date, and it is November twelfth, twenty twenty one. And a quote from the chairman of Warner Brothers, he said, We all believe this release date will give the filmmakers time and space to allow their artistry to truly flourish and deliver the best possible film to our fans. Um, So we also learned that filming will begin in the spring of 2020, not the fall of 2019, like we had previously been told. So it sounds like things are just kind of being pushed. They're going to start filming later. They're going to release the movie later than we expected. Um... Not exactly a surprise based on the way that things have been going, but now it is official. So what do we think about this news? 2019 is going to be a very, very slow year. (laughs) Yeah, totally agree. Um, I love reading press release statements like this that are so like fancy and fluffy and like, oh, we're going going to give you the best possible thing and give you (laughs) all this opportunity to flourish. Yeah. I, it's just like, yo, dude, I kind of want to know the real answer here. Like, and what kind of, I guess, boggles my mind a little bit is they're pushing it back so far, but then the filming is starting in spring, not in fall. And I don't know if that includes like pre-production, CGI, all of that. And maybe they're going to take, if that doesn't include that, then maybe they're taking that time to really build that part of it up. But if it does include that, like that's a really, really tight turnaround. Like how confident are you that you can film, edit, sound produce, CGI, like piece it all together in that short of a time frame? Yeah, so that was my original thought as well is that that's, that's a very, very fast turnaround. But generally I have like you know informed guesses about what constitutes pre-production what is actually you know the production duh i got that far and what is post-production but for our film buff expertise on the panel if we have any do we have like firm definitions of what constitutes like the pre-production phase aside from like writing and kind of you know planning and all that I, I'm just curious to know because like Gretchen you were saying like oh the timeline it gives us more time in the pre-production phase and it'll give Jill more time to write like aside from the writing like what else is involved in the pre-production phase that they would want another six months so to speak I would imagine uh, everything that has to do with like costuming set designing mm-hmm. uh, scoring even mm-hmm. I mean I'm sure that scoring is, is starting um, earlier than pre-production really um, costume, uh, costume fitting, um, location scouting. Yeah, you know, the locations and the costumes, I feel like, are the big ones. And then just like the director getting, being able to look at the script before they start filming. I imagine that's part of it. So the script has to be done. But that's a good question. Um, yeah, I've always just wondered because, you know, generally we, we throw around these terms and, um, I, you know, I've always kind of wondered, like, okay, well, if we want more time in the pre-end of things, like, what, what are we really aiming for? And all the comments that you guys, like, or ideas that you threw out there, you know, obviously make total sense. Um, All the scoring, that's really interesting. I think I've seen it where, like, they will, like, do scoring beforehand, but I also think I've seen it where, like, they will show... um, Like the chorus, like with the film and the kind of like orchestrating and conducting. But I don't know if that's also just like DVD features that I watch and that's not really how it's done in real life. And I just like to assume it's that magical for every movie. So, Yeah, I think it depends. I just listened to a podcast about Fellowship of the Ring and Howard Shore worked on that soundtrack the entire time. Like he was with it two years before the movie even premiered, you know, but a lot of movies, the composer will have six weeks. Like I think for Star Wars, he had six weeks. So I, I guess it just depends. This being the third movie, I feel like he would kind of have as much time as he wanted. So it's so pre-production, I'm looking at a workflow right now. This is really, uh, really helpful. It starts at the end of script development, and it goes all the way to principal photography. Right? And the steps involved, they have to uh, set up the okay, set up company. 
that comes in, and and, and I guess it, 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 they kind of start laying the groundwork, laying the pieces. Um, preliminary budget and schedule, uh, hire key develop uh, key department heads, creative planning begins, refine budget and schedule, secure rentals, props, permits, locations, etc. Hire crew and audition talent, which they've already done. Rehearse and final prep, so like table reads and stuff like that. So um, that's all in the pre-production phase. So that's a lot. It really is. That's even before you start, before you step on the set. Wow. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, look, they switched this date with Dune. <laughs> Dune, Dune is not... everyone was clamoring for Dune. <laughs> Dune is not the money maker for this studio, this franchise is. And the fact that I mean we've already talked about this, but the fact that Warner Brothers has already pushed it back as 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 far as they have, you know, that that tells me that they're worried. They're very very worried about the state of this franchise and they want they want to make sure that they get it right. <laughs> I was, I, uh, guys, I'm thinking about it right now, right? And Fantastic Beasts, The Crimes of Grindelwald has made like $700 million worldwide. <laughs> End the game made that in three days. <laughs> That's crazy to think about. That has to be one of those demoralizing moments where you're sitting and like you're part of the Crimes of Grindelwald like team who's like, you know, opening up your news homepage after Endgame has come out and it's like, oh, it's already surpassed. Titanic and then the, <laughs> the, the the income and and it's just like oh great awesome this is what we're up against um you know what I would love you know we're sitting here kind of like pontificating what pushing this back means and kind of like oh well they must be really worried and all this stuff so we all know that like the new trend of all the big major movies is to show up in July I think it's July in San Diego at comic-con and do their panel I want, and I challenge if they are listening, because of course they're listening. Duh, we're Hogwarts Radio. Um, (laughs) But I would challenge them to set up a panel at Comic-Con and just have, we're going to call it the Veritaserum panel, where we're just going to talk about everything that's gone down in the last year and a half. We're going to be super open with the fans, let them ask all of their questions, and just be like, yeah, you know what? Draft number one of the script was was horrible. We had to bring in the ringer. We had to bring in Joe. We have some questions about who's playing Grindelwald in the future. Um, you know, just I, I know it's never going to happen. I'm living in an alternate reality. I'm very good at that. But, you know, just for my two cents, Warner Brothers could be good. Could be good. Yeah, that's a thing yeah, that it, will never happen. I'm like, yeah, it definitely couldn't hurt, right? <laughs> Live in this world with me, friends. Live okay. in this world with me. I believe me. in you. Well, you mentioned Comic-Con, but actually, I'd be surprised if many people from the movies were even there. I bet Dan Fogler will be there because he tends to be in New York City and in America. Um, but I'd be surprised if many of the other people showed up or if they had like a big panel, you know? I mean... Crimes didn't do that great, and now we've got a two-year wait to the next film. So I, I wouldn't be surprised if they just skipped it because they don't have anything to offer. What or, would they bring to the table? Or they could use the opportunity to kind of respark the fandom and say, "Hey, you know what? We're going to be creating after the after the fan t- or yeah, as they could do it simultaneously. We're gonna uh, we're gonna do Beetle Beetle the Bard and Quidditch Through the Ages." as movies they could possibly do that yeah i just don't think it's gonna happen (laughs) yeah i mean i don't i don't disagree with you um especially just on the point that like we're in this weird time period on the film that like there's not really a ton to offer i will say this i went to comic-con way back in the day like i don't know 2010 i want to say um at least before Tron was released. And they didn't have any trailers. They didn't have anyone from the Tron cast come. But they came and they did, like, a, a production art panel on it. Um, and they showed, like, some sketches of, like, what the motorbikes were going to look like, what some of the costume designs looked like. And they just had an open discussion um, about, you know, the Tron, like, aesthetic and design. So in that sense, like, they have movies that have had enough hype have been able to kind of 
early enough, do like a sneak peek, so to speak, and not really offer a ton, but just to Terrence's point, get the fandom hyped about the film. Yeah, this is a long wait, you guys. Uh, this is, mm-hmm. you know, November 21, uh, 2021. That is a very long wait. And not many franchises can keep their fans interested that long. You know, what's going to say, what what is there to say that fans aren't just going to give up? They're going to be like, well, you know, I've waited, uh, you know, three years for this new Fantastic Beast film. I'm really not that invested in it. And it's just, it's not a good it's not a good look for the studio. All right. Let's talk about Wizards Unite. We are still waiting, but if you are in Australia or New Zealand, you may have gotten the beta version of the game. So I wanted to share a couple initial thoughts on the game. This comes from Chris at MuggleNet. Chris said that the game is very similar to Pokemon Go, but instead of collecting creatures, you act as an agent and you collect and contain instances of leaked magic. So we already kind of knew that, but here's a little bit more about the gameplay. So you're supposed to find these foundables. We've talked about this before. And Chris says, I came across a foundable just by walking approximately 100 meters along the street. I knew this because the iconic three stars appeared on the screen and urged me to align the stars with the target. Once I did this, I simply had to trace the appropriate spell on the screen and resolve the situation. The process was really easy, and it was quite fun to feel as though I were genuinely containing an incident of magic in a muggle area. That sounds pretty sweet. Um, Chris also says the game shows users a map that is accurate to their local geography and uses local landmarks, like post offices and shops, similar to Pokemon Go. Players don't need to enter the landmarks in order to interact with the destination. You just have to be near it. One drawback of the game, though, is that due to the augmented reality aspect, users are required to move around in areas that are highly populated with landmarks like shopping areas. This means that this game would not necessarily be as enjoyable or accessible to people who have mobility issues, people who are unable to leave their home, or people who live in rural or isolated areas. Um, Chris also mentions a couple bugs, which makes sense because it is still in a beta, of course. Um, But overall, it seems like it's a pretty good game, especially once more people can use it. Uh, And there's a couple pictures here on the website just kind of previewing things about the game. So a a little bit of new information here, a little bit of things we already knew about, a couple sneak peeks. What do you guys think about this? So I'm excited for it to come out in the United States. Um, Obviously, it's going to be one of the biggest markets uh, for for this game. But um, I'm, I'm interested to see... Yeah, I, I would. I, I'm gonna. I, I I would love to play it, and I'm going to play it, and I'm gonna play the hell out of it. But I want to know what the the public reaction to this is. Like, is it something that's just it's gonna fizzle out? Like, is it what What are they gonna do to kind of keep public interest up with the game? Because it looks great. It really does, and it looks like something that you can play for a long time. Uh, much like Pokemon Go is. But, you know, like uh, Niantic's done a wonderful job with the Hogwarts Mystery Game and updating that and keeping it fresh. I just hope that they do that with this Wizards Unite game. Um, and I'm, I'm I'm incredibly excited for it. The, the, the reviews so far look very promising. So, Terrence, you just commented, like, what are they going to do in terms of keeping, you know, the, the game from fizzling out? Um, the expression fizzling out really resonated with me because as... Gretchen was describing the game and, oh, it's like Pokemon Go and, you know, you're going to diverse shopping marts and all this stuff to to collect stuff. I kind of felt myself going like, oh, okay. Um, and I, I knew this was coming. We have talked about this. We knew it was going to be like Harry – or like Harry Potter. <laughs> Good job, Alex. Uh, like Pokemon Go. Um, and we, we've had discussions about that in the past. I – I guess I am cautiously optimistic um, that there is going to be a magical flair to this to which will captivate me. And obviously the world of Harry Potter is enough in and of itself. Um, But in terms of, you know, dedicating the time to the game and and keeping up with the game, um, I want to see what flair they put on it. That isn't just kind of a Harry Potter universe transposed onto a Pokemon Go format. Um, so I'm, I'm interested to see what they do to spice it up. Um, I remember when we had talked about this a couple weeks ago, we talked about, you know, when people were just like running around and 
I had jurors catching Pokemon in my office. I loved the comment that Gretchen was saying like, oh, you don't have to go into the landmarks and to Terrence's point that they are taking security and privacy a little bit more seriously with this game. I couldn't help but giggle. And it's like, yes, you don't have to go into the post office where people are curmudgeons waiting in line for 30 minutes to go catch something magical and have a postal worker just be like, get out, get out. Um, so I just had a wonderful image of that in my head. Um, but uh, and, and this is another one of those Alex is late to the game questions because that happens every time I'm on. Why did they beta release to um, New Zealand? Uh, can anyone answer that to me? Is it because it's like a smaller population? Like, what's the reasoning behind that? I have no idea. Uh, mm. Imagine if they opened up a beta to the United States, right? It would crash literally every server. They want to make sure that they can do this right. Um, they want to make sure that they, you know, that they have the technology infrastructure in place to be able to support a game like this. Um, mm. You know, and, and, and yeah, sure, they want to gauge public interest and, and all that good stuff, but... I think it's more of the technical side, you know, oh, there's going to be all these bugs. Well, we don't want to release a buggy product to our largest market. You know, we don't want to put out a product where people are just going to tear it limb from limb without us actually releasing it. You know, it's it, it'd be still in its beta form. I remember whenever uh, Hogwarts Mystery uh, came out in, in its beta form, wherever it was released first, there was there was a lot of things wrong with it. And then now, whenever it was released to the United States and and to the UK and you know to all the all all the places that you know they knew that it was going to receive um, a, a heavy amount of traffic, it was a solid product. Well, New Zealanders, you're lucky buggers. Enjoy. <laughs> um. So I never played Pokemon Go. So Terrence, maybe you can answer this. Did it have a lot of in-app purchases or ads the way that Hogwarts Mystery does? Um, so initially, I don't think so. I mean, I haven't played it in a long time, but um, initially it, it did not have in-app purchases. Quite frankly, they didn't know how it was going to be received. And then once they saw, oh, my God, this is like the most viral thing ever, uh, then that's whenever they were like, oh, let's, let, let's start adding in-app purchases and monetizing and, and all that other stuff. And I'm sure that Warner Brothers already has their hands open, like, give me your money. Um, and, yeah. and we know exactly what we're going to do for in-app purchases. Um, I wouldn't expect too many, like, on the, the initial launch. Uh, but as the game is updated or, and goes through the motions over, you know, the next six months or so, I would say that, yeah, they're going to start um, promoting that pretty heavy because mm -hmm. that was one of the things that lost me on hogwarts mystery i played for a pretty solid like six months and then i was like oh i don't have the time anymore to just sit here and wait for things to load or like come back in the certain time frame to make sure i can finish my task and without it starting over like that just was so frustrating to me so i'm hoping this is a bit more like you can you can start and go it sounds like it is all right, let's talk about our <laughs> seems to be weekly update about the Universal <laughs> Orlando Hagrid's Magical Creatures Motorbike Adventures ride, a name I finally learned. Say that 10 times fast. What? What? I can't even say it 10 times once. <laughs> <laughs> so they have released a picture of the Hagrid figure that will appear on the ride, and they have called it their most lifelike animated figure that was a whole quote, but I'm assuming they meant ever. The figure, which took thousands of hours to create, has a motion profile of 24 different body movements and facial expressions. His costume was designed by the film's wardrobe team, and his height is the same as Hagrid's in the movie, 7 feet, 6 inches. But even more than that, they took a scan of Robbie Coltrane's mouth to create Hagrid's teeth. So that's like above and beyond um but if you take a look at this figure it is pretty lifelike i mean it's kind of crazy what do you guys think about it no they just paid robbie coltrane to stand there i mean that's that is robbie coltrane holding the umbrella in the dragon high gloves yeah seriously no, you can't convince me otherwise <laughs> What I think is interesting is I do think it's very lifelike. I do think they did a, a phenomenal job. 
and maybe this is just me fixating on something kind of weird, but looking at the pictures, is it just me or are his like facial wrinkles really accentuated? Like, and they have like a profile shot and there's like one epic, like curmudgeon wrinkle thing in the side of his nose. I'm just like, <laughs> did Hagrid really have that? And that's probably just me like nitpicking. Um, but it, it is kind of amazing how far animatronics have gone. Like I, you know, grew up in LA, went to Disneyland all the time as a kid and, you know, Pirates of the Caribbean, we thought was fantastic that they had like the drunk guy swinging off the barrel. And I compare like the kind of questionable animatronics to this. I'm like, damn, that's pretty legit. Um, I also think it's kind of crazy that they actually took a scan of his mouth. Like, did they, I mean, I don't doubt the fandom that there's probably one person out there who's going to ride the ride, you know, if they didn't do that, be like, his teeth are too small. Um, I have 100% faith in the fandom, but I wonder if someone in, like, the production team was like, we have to do this. It has to be exact. Like, or maybe it's just because the dimensions on Hagrid are so big. Like, that's the only way you get appropriate dimensions for his teeth. I don't know. I just would have loved to have been part of that conversation to hear the rationale of why we had to take a scan of Robbie Coltrane's mouth. Mm -hmm. 24 different body movements and facial expressions. So I would assume... Uh that we're going to see him open his mouth and, mm -hmm. you know, get a view of his teeth or... He is going to speak. Robbie Coltrane did record a script for the ride, so he will talk. Ooh, I wonder what the script is. Do we have any information on that? No. What's interesting is they said in their release that you'll find him with the blast and its group trying to round it up, but they also said he would be guiding you through the forest. So I'm a little confused as to whether it's something that will be kind of attached to the cart or is it something that will be they have multiples of them at different points or he's he gets off the cart with the scroots i'm still a little fuzzy on the details there or is he what? on his own separate track and kind of following right. you through your own adventure through the forest mm -hmm. or even like on the um the the hogwarts ride in orlando you kind of follow Ron, Harry, and Hermione intermittently throughout the ride. Like they're on their brooms and you follow them and like, you know, they you detour when you run into the Dementors or the spiders and then they pop back at certain points. And it could be like Hagrid is kind of guiding you in that sense. And as you deviate, maybe he disappears from the narrative and then pops back in that kind of way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's possible. Um, do we expect him to be on a motorcycle, you think? I hope so. That would make sense. God, I hope so. For the mouthful <laughs> that is that ride's that name. name. If he's not on a motorbike. Lord help us all. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously. Them for making me say that and then break all of the news about it. I'm not bitter. <laughs> so guys, I just have to say in this little promo shot here, and I don't mean to be nitpicky at all, but... His broom, it, I mean, his his umbrella is not pink. They're calling it pink, which is interesting. So I think that may be the fault of the picture. Well, they That's could... not nitpicky. That's canon. <laughs> That's important. <laughs> That's important. I'm looking because he has the dragon hide gloves on, which is awesome. He's got, you know, he's got his trench coat on, his belt, uh, his distressed shirt, which looks really cool. Uh, but that umbrella is just getting me. I don't know. <laughs> I do think it might be a product of like the quality of the picture. Um, and for those who are, who can see this or who can't, I'm like contorting my head in every different angle, trying to see if I can get a different angle on the picture, like the genius that I am. But I feel like I can see like hints of like frayed pink in there. Like it looks like an incredibly worn umbrella that maybe at one point, was pink or maybe i'm just trying so hard to redeem the fatal flaw that they have made <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, i'll give them bit I'll, I'll give them the benefit of the doubt this is the first picture we've seen of him all together so i'm not you know i'm not too worried and i don't i'm sorry i don't mean to be like really picky at all about that um but you know that's part of hagrid is his pink umbrella so We'll see. Our next bit of news actually relates to the Battle of Hogwarts, which we were talking about. So Rotten Tomatoes actually just celebrated its 21st birthday, and they released some new videos to celebrate. So because it was the 21st anniversary of the Battle of Hogwarts, they gave us a clip 
with exclusive new information from director David Yates. So he talked about the fight between Harry and Voldemort and kind of his decision, the whole team's decision to split the film into two movies. So on that note, his decision to break the film into two movies, he said, I felt you could create two interesting films with Hollows Part 1, an independent, much more intimate movie, when Harry, Ron, and Hermione are in the real world for the very first time, having to learn some really hard life lessons. And the second part was more of the blockbuster, entertaining conclusion to the whole series, which felt much more appropriate. This, of course, has been a topic in the fandom for the entire time since it was announced. So what do you guys think about this kind of new tidbit from him that the first movie he thought they could do much more intimate film with Harry, Ron, Hermione, and the second movie would be like the big blockbuster ending? I like the first movie. I really did. Um, And it's probably one of my favorites probably my second favorite of the Potter films. Um, I, I just really, I, I enjoyed that it was a road movie because they are in the wilderness learning, having to deal with each other, having to deal with this bit of magic that they have no idea the effects that it's having on them, um, trying to live with each other and, you, you know, just just basically survive. And I, I mean, I think it was needed, uh, definitely. I, I, okay, yeah, it was needed because it's canon, right? It is from the books. But um, I feel like it was important to kind of establish that for the first movie because if we just did, you know, all battle all through the first movie and through the second movie, it would just be like one huge, long, three on, three and a half hour battle sequence, which could get pretty dull at times. Yeah, I completely agree with you. I loved um, Deathly Hallows Part 1. Um, and hearing Gretchen read that snippet, um, from David Yates kind of, um, clarified it. I mean, it helps me see it a lot more clearly, like the clear designation between the two. And I love that he described Deathly Hallows part one as kind of being the more intimate reflection into Deathly Hallows, um, because it is, I mean, you get some of those beautiful scenes. Like I love the, you know, the scene between Ron and Hermione um, towards the end where they're trying to find an uplifting moment in all of this. And it's the two of them listening to the radio and dancing together. I believe that is part one. I hope that's part one. Um, so yes, but that's Harry and Hermione. Harry and Hermione. Yeah. Oh, sorry guys. We knew what I was talking about. Come on now. Uh, Ron left them. Don't forget. I know. Ron, dirty traitor. Um, no, Harry and Hermione. I apologize. Um, but I love that scene. I think it's so beautiful and it's so touching and you get those little moments and you get this insight of like a a handful of teenagers trying to figure out how to save the world. And they really are just kind of ill-equipped teenagers with some luck on their side trying to figure this out. And I, I love that intimacy. And I also think that if you try to incorporate all the blockbuster features of the Battle of Hogwarts and make that into one movie, you are going to sacrifice some of those moments that you really needed to happen, even though everyone complains about the camping, especially in the books about how long it takes for them to go for again camping. Um, I think you needed that for it to be you know, just critical to the story. So I like that they broke it up in two parts. Yeah. You needed to have those beautiful moments between Harry and Hermione to kind of establish that, Hey, we are just friends. Um, (laughs) You know, it's, 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 it's not going to be anything more than that. Uh, We're just friends um, trying to complete a mission or we're just friends comforting one, comforting one another um, in, in a time of need. And I thought one of the most beautiful scenes of Deathly Hallows Part 1 was whenever Harry found his parents at uh, his parents' gravestone. And um, Hermione kind of did that little bit of magic and created a wreath. And I mean, it was Christmas time too, so none of them had that, you know, the idea of, um, oh my God, it's actually, we've been doing this for so long. And just that 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 little bit of, for intimacy um, with them in that shot was was beautiful. What was that again, Taryn? For intimacy. <laughs> I like it. I love that. <laughs> so we're kind of coming off the heels now of Endgame, so I want to posit this question to you both. If they had decided we don't want to split it into two movies, instead we're going to make one long epic movie like Endgame or Return of the King, how do you think that would have gone? Do you think we would have seen any differences? Would it have been more well-received? Would we not even be talking about it now? What do you both think? 
Well, so I have to make a guilty confession that I still haven't seen Endgame yet. No, I'm going to get around to it. I swear. I swear. I keep telling myself I'm going to, and I'm going to. Um, but I digress. Um, to the general point um, that doesn't yeah. require that I have seen mega Endgame. Mega size movie. What do you think about that? Uh, I think having known both versions, because we, we, we kind of have the mega size movie in other franchise. I feel like the third installment of Lord of the Rings was that mega size movie that like Frodo, get off the rock, get off the lava rock. We are ready for this to end. It's like we've all been in that Frodo moment. Um, having known that general concept and knowing what Deathly Hallows was, I wouldn't change Deathly Hallows for anything. I really wouldn't. Um, I enjoyed it that much. So, okay, a, a question. <laughs> would, uh, would we have to cut stuff out of either movie? Or are you just talking about, like, that's running the... it all together? Because if you're, Right, if that's you... the thing. Because, I mean, they are both two-hour movies and change. So you combine them together would make a longer movie than I'm kind of thinking. So you would end up sacrificing something, but you might end up changing things to make it all flow together. Or, you know, because you wouldn't have the be building to a big climax in part one because you would be still in the middle of the movie. Right. No, that's... that. That's true. Um, the only problem that I would have with the... I wouldn't mind a four-hour movie. That's that's just me. I know a lot of people would because people were freaking out over three-hour in-game and they're like, um, when are we going to go to the bathroom? You know, the answer is mm -mm. before that movie starts, <laughs> you know. Um, mm -hmm. But they would... Yeah, the question is sacrifice what would you sacrifice what would you cut out and and honestly the way that deathly hallows part one and part two were on the screen i i don't see what you could cut out i i just i don't know i don't see what you could cut out and still have the same kind of impact well this is a great transition for the other interesting thing that yates talked about which i think some people could argue you might want to cut out so he talked a bit about that final battle between Harry and Voldemort. He said the sequence is about a boy facing down this nemesis, this demon that has haunted him throughout his childhood. This is the figure that had killed his parents. I was keen to explore this unique relationship between Voldemort and Harry. So he decided to have them kind of apparate around Hogwarts. He's, he's talking a bit in the video about how he wanted Harry to like grab Voldemort and say, let's finish this together and then get them to the courtyard, which of course was a different setting than the final showdown in the books. He said he wanted it to be in the courtyard to give it the feel of like a Western. So what do you both think about this battle between Harry and Voldemort? So I wasn't expecting it to be done the way that it was. Um, but the final showdown, I was a little bit disappointed that it didn't happen in the Grey Hall because the way that Joe had really set the scene of Voldemort and Harry in the Great Hall and this final standoff. Um, I didn't read Western into it at all. Um, the only thing Western about it was just they were standing off. They were facing off against each other. But um, you really had those details, like the way that the light poured through the windows because it was starting to be morning. Um, the way that people just... You know, they stood around, they watched, and that's just that, that 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 was one of the one of the issues that I had with that final sequence. I wish it was done in the Ray Hall. I almost wonder if because they were thinking like part one is the intimate part and part two is gonna be that big blast blockbuster if they felt like they had to do a big final showdown because i think in the books it is much more understated it's a more of a like beautiful powerful moment in its own right and i think they just went so far the other direction because they were like this is the end of eight movies we got to do something big if we don't do something big the people are gonna riot so i think i wonder if they felt a lot of pressure to do something big that they thought would make the film yeah, and also in terms of the fandom that the the chunk of the fandom that hasn't read the books but was, you know, enamored with the films, they were probably had expectations going into it that some of us who have read the films like Bibles or read the books like Bibles, you know, didn't work quite attached to so much. Um, I think it is hilarious that the comment was I wanted it to be like a Western. 
I get zilch Western vibe out of that scene at all. Like I am replaying the courtyard scene in my head with like the Western soundtrack in the background, like the tumbleweeds wow, and all that. Like, wow. Exactly. That noise is playing on loop in my head right now. And I'm just like, no, there's nothing about this that says Western. Um, I was pretty disappointed. I mean, so the first time I watched part two, I think I, the adrenaline was just pumping so hard that it just, I was like, Oh my God, it's happening guys. It's happening. <coughs> Excuse me. And I didn't quite process that change. But as I have rewatched the films over, you know, time, I think one of the poetic things about it, not your, know, the, about the way Joe wrote it being in the great hall is at least to me, Hogwarts, made Harry and Hogwarts made Voldemort and like this is kind of the heartbeat and the epicenter of Hogwarts and this is where the destruction is finally happening and we completely skipped over that um I don't know if that really translates all that well in film and I will give credit that like you want that blockbuster feeling maybe cinematography wise you have such a large cast you're doing such a large battle scene you need a little bit more real estate so hell let's justify it as a western you know there's probably a lot more that we don't know to it but i think that poignancy of it occurring in the great hall was completely lost and i'm a little heartbroken about it agreed so he ended the video by talking a bit about what it was like to be the person to finish the series um, and kind of the expectations that goes with that. So he said that was probably the biggest challenge, knowing that expectations were sky high and that people wanted to have a properly satisfying emotional resolution to this series of stories. And I think we did it. Do you agree with him that they gave us a properly satisfying emotional resolution to the series of stories? Yeah, I'm happy with the way the series ended. I didn't have uh, look most of my most of my qualms with the series it's just like what they didn't put in but i felt like they told the story well um and they stayed as true to to the seven books as they could have agreed i mean i i loved it i did get a satisfaction out of it um when it was over i think my only qualms were the makeup effects in the epilogue um you mm -hmm. know that, that was really the only beef that i had with it um but yeah, I mean, it's hard because I am a true Chris Columbus fan. I love all of his films. I love all of his work. So there's like this small bitter part of me that's like, why wasn't it Chris Columbus at the end? But I do think David Yates delivered on giving us closure and giving us an ending that was worthy of eight films. So Alex, you mentioned Chris Columbus, which leads right into our This Week in Potter History segment. In 2004, he announced that he would be leaving the franchise. Uh, after he produced Prisoner of Azkaban, he decided to move on. Quote, I'm history. I'm gone after this film. This is my swan song. I will not be among the producers on Goblet of Fire. I was in England for the first half of Azkaban, and although I went back to San Francisco, I was able to listen to the scoring and check the visual effects every day through the magic of computers. 2004. Beautiful time. That's how I kept in touch with England. I also had people from my company working there. But everyone at this point, after four and a half years, really wants to come home. And I would feel wrong taking a producer credit on Goblet because I can't be there. So not a big surprise there. He wanted to... <laughs> be in america with his family but kind of like what you were saying alex what i wanted to bring up with this potter history segment how do we think these movies would have changed if chris did stay on if he was able to produce or even direct some of the future films do you think we would see a difference or anything Thing would change? I don't think there would have been as much creative license with Prisoner of Azkaban as there was. Um, although I actually, at first I hated the, the amount of creative license Alphonse Grion took with Prisoner of Azkaban, but over time it really grew on me actually. Um, so, I, and that's a whole other topic that we could talk about. I do think that had Chris Columbus stayed on, there would have been more of a like traditionalist approach, so to speak. I mean, like, we all pretty much suffered through Chamber of Secrets because of that extreme commitment to the traditionalist approach. Although I love Chamber of Secrets, so but I know I'm in the minority on that one. Um, so I don't know if we would have seen a like a bifurcation of the two films in um, Deathly Hallows. I really, I really don't because I don't know if that would have been his style. Um, I think Goblet of Fire would have been way different. Um, 
because we do kind of have like a weird departure in Goblet of Fire too. So I'm not, I don't know. I think there would be some differences, but I do think um, uh, Order of the Phoenix, wow, brain fart. Order of the Phoenix and um, Half-Blood Prince would have probably been substantially the same, but I do think we would have seen differences in Goblet of Fire, and I don't think Deathly Hallows would have been bifurcated into two. So I... I have thoughts. <laughs> I have thoughts. Um, Chris Chris Columbus would have kept these movies uh, like PG PG. I mean, I, I say I say PG as in they, he would have kept them family movies and wouldn't have been as dark. Um, he would have definitely not used uh, the same color palette that Alfonso used, that Mike Newell used, that David Yates used. I feel like the movies would be. Uh, at least a little more brighter. Um, I just feel like these movies would have been different. The story would have been told uh, in a different light. Uh, and and I don't know if that would necessarily have been a good thing or a bad thing. I can't imagine Chris Columbus directing something like Half-Blood Prince or uh, Deathly Hallows. It, it just, it's not his style. Um, and if he were to have directed them, we wouldn't have gotten nearly as awesome battle sequences as we got you wouldn't have had those moments between the 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 teen tension between you know like lavender brown and hermione you wouldn't have had lavender brown and ron it would have probably just been them holding hands and not snogging in the hallway i don't know chris columbus definitely has a, a more different flavor than any of the other directors yeah i actually kind of like that point because um you know as the films go on harry and everybody matures and you kind of want to see it through that maturation that lens of where they are in life and as much as i love christopher columbus he's directed or chris columbus he's directed some of my favorite films of all time um i do agree that it would have had kind of a pg pg 13 lens at most and we kind of would have lost what is the snark and the maturity and the growth that happens in the books and with the characters as well. All right, Terrence, I'll turn it over to you for this week in Hogwarts radio history. You know, I feel so old that we get to do this now. Um, but this week in Hogwarts radio history, back on back in 2010, I believe, we released episode 46. And the reason why this one is so special, we released it as a time turner Thursday as well, I, I think. Um, don't quote me on that one. But uh, it had a special guest, John Granger. And have either of you heard of John Granger at all? Kind of, sort of? Eh, kind of? Okay. Well, he, he currently hosts the Reading, Writing, Rolling uh, podcast that MuggleNet um, has. Um, and, and, but this, this episode, we really got into the literary alchemy of the series and the ring composition of the series. Um, I really want you guys to go and check it out at HogwartsRadio.com. You should be able to, I'll have it in a special place right there on the homepage um, that you're, that you're able to, to take a listen. But I, I, I thought of this series in a different light after that discussion, um, how the, the, like the colors um, correlated to uh, different characters and different events and like how Dumbledore was a very white character and I'm not talking about, you know, skin color or anything like that. I'm talking about, like, his action. So I, I just really invite you to go check it out and check out John Granger's uh, works. I believe his site is thehogwartsprofessor.com. And um, he has a couple of books up there for sale where he talks about all of this stuff. Very, very smart man. Um, and I'm just, like, I'm in awe of, like, every time I'm around him. It's just, I feel smarter, smarter by osmosis or something. I don't know. But um, please go check it out. Episode 46. Let's move on to a few announcements before we uh, wrap up today's show. Our first announcement is about Into the Common Room. And we are going to be more consistent with that one because we're releasing it to patrons only once per month. So we already posted a few of them over on Patreon already. But now second years and up patrons will have access to the monthly postings uh, for the Into the Common Room segment. And it includes a lot of additional content, such as bloopers or the fun that we have before and after each episode. I know we have one for this episode, uh, which is hilarious. So please, we invite you to go check it out. It's only about 10, 15 minutes long. 
um, at most. And it just kind of gives you a little inside information about our podcast and what we go through to prepare for each episode. Next announcement is thank you to those that have left us a review on iTunes. Your feedback goes a long way to let letting other people know what you think about the podcast. Uh, next, we have the Meeting Walt podcast. That's Tyler's brand new Disney show. You guys go check this out. Um, amazing stuff. They just recorded for their Beauty and the Beast release that's coming up on their next episode. But they've already um, done a Goofy movie, The Lion King, Peter Pan. Uh, what was the one that they did last week? I can't remember. Toy Story. Toy Story. There you go. Toy yes, Story. I listen. And we highly recommend that you go take a listen. It's, it's it's good stuff. And if you're a Disney fanatic, you're going to love this show. And our final announcement is uh, about a former host project. And this is Grayson's project that he's really pumping a lot of his time and effort and money into. Um, and, and so I want you guys to go check it out. It's called Another Dimension Comic. And it's an upcoming comic book about a teenage Bigfoot, Jackalope, and Loch Ness Monster who battle high school in another dimension. So go ahead and give them a follow over on social media and uh, you know check out the website. I think it's anotherdimensioncomic.com. Um, and he is publishing the first issue uh, for free. That And you guys can, can read it online. So fun stuff there. All right. Well, let's go ahead and move to our final segment of the day. And this is Avada Kedavra, Amortentia Imperio, the Wizarding World's version of Screw, Mary Kill. I'm going to go ahead and kick it to Alex first. Alex, you'll give to Gretchen. Gretchen, you'll go ahead and give back to me here. So Alex, your three characters are Rubius Hagrid, Newt Scamander, Jacob Kowalski. Oh, that's terrible in a wonderful way. Um, such affectionate, adorable characters. Um, okay. I think I would, I'll start with Amortentia and I would give that to Newt. Um, because let's be real, Newt's a babe. Also, um, Newt's a health puff. Got to keep it in the house. Um, so that's all good. Um, uh, I think the Imperial is going to have to go to Jacob. And I feel so bad about that because I adore him and he's wonderful. But how could you do that to Hagrid? Hagrid is just too long standing. So, um, or no, actually, I take that back. My Avada Kedavra would go to Jacob, and then my Imperia would probably go to Hagrid. Um, Heartless. That was really Heartless. Hard. Uh. Really hard. Gosh. You're calling me heartless. You're the one who teed me up for a heartless response, Terrence. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> oh, just another Wednesday night, folks. Um, okay. So I am teeing it off to Madam Gretchen. Mm -hmm. um, all right, my dear. You have... Percy Weasley, hmm. Charlie Weasley, mm. and Fred Weasley. And Joel. Well, 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 that's quite the trio. Um, I don't think it's that hard, though, to be honest. I feel like these are kind of no brainers. We'll see if people are with me. Um, I'm going to Avada Kedavra Percy. Nothing against Percy. I think he has actually quite a lovely arc in the stories. Um, but. Uh, I don't feel a need to keep him alive compared to the other two. So I will Avada Kedavra Percy. I will Imperio Charlie so he can take me on a dragon. Easy. And then I will Immortentia Fred and we will have a joke shop and be happy. Easy. That that was no brainer, right? What wasn't that what everyone was thinking? Yeah, that yeah, was pretty adorable. Read my mind, Gretchen. Jesus. <laughs> I got to practice uh <laughs> Occlumency now. That was the easiest one I've ever gotten. <laughs> All right, Terrence, here are your three. Oh, it's um, professors. I'm going with the oh, theme of professors. Th thank you for keeping it like humans. I appreciate that. <laughs> Not plants uh, and Yes, beasts they are and... all humans. Okay. My first thought was creatures, and I was going to do creatures, but uh decided against it, going with professors. So thank you. number one, um, Pomona Sprout. Number two, Horace Slughorn. And number three, Phileas Flitwick. Okay, so I am going to 
Amortentia Slughorn, I think, because, um, yeah, I know. I got the Oxford Slughorn. All right. Giggity, giggity, Tim giggity. Broadbent. Get it. <laughs> um, no, because it's, you know, you, he's a potions master. They're always, like, handy to have around, and especially one, like, of him like he's been doing it for a long time and hey i i get to be a part of the slug club now so that's my <laughs> ticket into that i uh, like no more lonely christmases you know i get to invite to the christmas party um so i'm gonna have to imperio flitwick because um uh i he's he's wonderful at charms i you know and he, i i could use his ability to I can use his ability to uh, to really do my bidding without any repercussions. I suppose you know if you if you if he dies doing whatever he's doing, you know it's like half a person. So you know, point five. I'm kidding. (laughs) (laughs) That's awful. You're fired. It's like half a death right there, right? (laughs) Um. And I'm going to Avada Kedavra Professor Sprout because I don't have any need for a herbology professor. Yeah. Sorry. Watch. Like, her final act of malice towards me is going to be, like, throwing mandrakes out the window, (laughs) landing on me as I cast the curse at her or something. I don't know. (laughs) Um, So that is how we play Avada Kedavra Amortentia Imperio. And that is how we do it, folks. Week after week, time after time, episode after episode. We want to thank everybody so much for tuning in. Give us a tap on that subscribe button. No, we'll sit here and wait. Go do it. Yeah, we're not joking. Go ahead. Just take your time. We still got six minutes to fill, folks. I'm kidding. <laughs> yeah, give us a, a follow on our social media outlets as well. We are just two patrons away from our next goal on Patreon, so we definitely appreciate all the support that you guys have shown us out there. Our next goal is going to be a live AMA with the hosts, and we are going to record our Chamber of Secrets commentary, which is going to be fun stuff. So um, please go ahead and check us out over there, patreon.com slash Hogwarts Radio. And that is all the time that we have for you this week. I want to thank everybody so much for tuning in. Once again, I'm Terrence Pinkston. I'm Alex Lohman. And I'm Pomona Sprout. And we'll see you next time for episode 244. Bye-bye. That was bloody brilliant. Codswallop.